Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, yesterday uh, we discussed, uh, we were left discussing the classification of uh, supersymmetric geometry which arises from the study of the killing spinner equations uh, arising from new minimal supergravity. And uh, we discovered that um, we can have one uh, supercharge uh, corresponding to a left-handed uh, spinner uh, whenever uh, the manifold uh, is complex. <coughs> and that, uh, uh, or vice you could also have a right-handed supercharge when M is complex, but if the complex structure is anti-self dual. Uh, I should uh, point out some references about uh, this. So there is a paper by Clare, Tomasiello, and Zaffaroni, uh, APTH, and also another reference by Dumitrescu, Seiberg, and myself. So um, one comment uh, that uh, we should make about this uh, case of uh, uh, one supercharge on some generic complex manifold is that uh, we have to turn on some, um, well, generically you have to turn on some non-trivial uh, UNR uh, gauge field, and therefore the resulting theory might only make sense if the uh, R charges of uh, the fields are quantized in some way. So for instance, it definitely makes sense if all the fermions have R charges which are uh, odd integers, and uh, the bosons have R charges, which are even integers. Uh, but depending on the manifold, it might be that uh, other um, quantizations are allowed. So, so generically, the R charges should be quantized. And then the other comment is that there are also manifolds for which we don't have to turn on some non-trivial uh, UNR bundle. Uh, one example is S3 times S1. Uh, and then, um, well, then the R charges of the fields can be whatever they want. Uh, but uh, uh, there's still like, uh, th there might still be more data that one has to give, like, well, one has to choose like some spin structure or some other uh, similar um, discrete data. Uh, we also discussed a little bit what happens if one requires uh, more supercharges. And uh, uh, so I am not going to comment very much on the case of uh, uh, two Qs uh, with the same uh, corresponding to two left-handed spinners or two right-handed spinners. But you can find some, well, the relevant uh, discussion in this paper. Uh, as I said, uh, in the non-compact case, uh, we don't have an answer for what is the classification of the corresponding manifolds. And the, for the compact case, like uh, one is left with very little, namely like uh, the four torus uh, with the flat metric, the uh, S3 times S1 with the round metric, and the K3. Uh, so that's uh, uh, not particularly... Yeah, so that's a very short list. Uh, and OK, for the case of S3 times S1, there can be some quotients uh, of it. <coughs> and uh, the other case I looked at uh, just uh, yesterday was the case with uh, when one has one solution uh, zeta and one solution zeta tilde. So therefore, correspondingly, there will be one charge, one supercharge of R charge minus 1 and one supercharge of R charge plus 1. Um, and then, as I said, this, is, uh, this uh, case is better analyzed thinking about the killing vector zeta sigma mu zeta tilde, which uh, turns out to be holomorphic with respect both the complex structure arising from zeta and the complex structure arising from zeta tilde. Okay. And uh, I also wrote down like the form of the metric 
uh, which is well, the most general metric compatible with this structure. Oops. Uh, okay, so next, I uh, would like to make some uh, uh, comment uh, about uh, background vector multiplets. So as we discussed, uh, when we, your theory has some U1 symmetry, uh, some flavor symmetry, then you can uh, couple it to background gauge fields. So uh, what I'd like to uh, discuss is, uh, suppose we are on a manifold which allows for one supercharge Q, uh, which is uh, corresponding to a left-handed spinner. So then let's suppose also that our theory has some, uh, let's say, U1 flavor symmetry. We want to know uh, what kind of uh, background gauge fields we can introduce on top of this background, which would preserve the same supercharge. So we have already discussed uh, what uh, the so background gauge field So in one of the past lectures, we already discussed what is the um, uh, relevant equations that uh, we have to satisfy. And uh, so our background gauge field is comprised of uh, 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 well, the gauge field mu and a, an auxiliary scalar d. Uh, there are fermions, but those are set to 0 in the background. And uh, the supersymmetry the fact that this background preserves supersymmetry stems from the variation of the gauge genus, which should be zero. And that gives, so in the case we only have one zeta uh, corresponding to one Q, we only have one equation that we have to satisfy. Where F mu is the field strength corresponding to a mu. So this should be zero. And now, Using the fact that uh, you know that there is a complex, that this uh, z gives rise to a complex structure, you can rewrite uh, this equation as telling you that the anti holomorphic part of f is zero and that. Very good. <laughs> I can just, uh, I'm unable to copy from my own notes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> then, <laughs> the okay, so, <laughs> so we have, uh, so this is the uh, first condition, and uh, the second condition is that uh, D uh, will be determined by contracting the field strength with uh, the complex structure. Okay. <coughs> So if we are in a situation where like, uh, there is also another supercharge and we want to our background gauge field to also preserve that one, then we would have more restrictive conditions. Okay. okay so let, uh, let's give an example. Um, so uh, in particular, uh, there is uh, some uh, interesting family of uh, complex manifolds, uh, which are called op surfaces. So let's talk about op surfaces. So these are complex manifolds uh, that are diffeomorphic to S3 times S1. And uh, they can all be described as the a quotient of the two-dimensional uh, complex plane, the second, yeah, the C2 uh, minus the origin by a cyclic group. And uh, now we can describe what this uh, quotient is. So there are two cases. Uh, the first one, which I think goes by the name of primary op surface. So we'll introduce complex coordinate W and Z on the two complex planes. And then these are identified as uh, PW and QZ. 
where P and W um, are complex numbers which are sub subject to this constraint. So they are less than one, so this is a contraction, and, uh, uh, and uh, P is less or equal than the absolute value of P is less than or equal than the absolute value of Q, and they're both greater than zero. So this gives rise to a two complex dimensional family of uh, complex manifolds, all diffeomorphic to S3 times S1, and uh, P and Q uh, are the complex structure moduli uh, of, this, uh, of this family. So different P and Qs correspond to distinct complex structures. Uh, then there is, uh, <coughs> so this is uh, something that uh, we will discuss more. Then there is the other case, which is weirder, and uh, I won't have a lot to say about this. Maybe we can have some discussion after the lecture um, with people that are interested. So in this case, the identification is the following. So there is an integer, a positive integer n, and uh, q again has to be such that this norm is in between um, one and zero. Lambda is uh, any complex parameter, and uh, n is a positive integer, it's a natural number. So one comment here is that it would appear that, uh, again, this would be a two-parameter family uh, of, uh, of different, uh, well, that the complex structure would be parameterized by two moduli, one being lambda and the other one being q. But uh, that is actually false, uh, because as you can uh, realize very easily, if I rescale the coordinate w and z, I can rescale away lambda. So lambda is a fictional parameter. Uh, it can be whatever, it cannot be zero, but, uh, so maybe I should take out zero from here. <coughs> but otherwise you can set it to be whatever you want, uh, say one. Uh, but q is instead uh, a uh, complex, uh, complex modulo, and uh, there are several of these branches, and they are like uh <coughs> indecised by this integer. Okay, so now for the le let's discuss a little bit more the primary case. So case A. Um, so we can write down what p and we can give some parameterization for p and q in terms of uh, some uh, uh, real positive number beta and some angle theta and uh, similarly for q oops e to the minus beta q plus uh, i theta q <coughs> so again because of these uh, conditions, we have that uh, uh, beta q and beta p are positive, and uh, that uh, e they have to satisfy the following relation. Uh, while theta p and theta q are just angles, <coughs> and then in terms of this, uh, uh, in terms of these beta p's and beta q's, we can write down some parameterization for the coordinates w and z. So we can write w as e to the minus mm, e to the minus beta p plus i theta p times x times uh, cosine of theta over 2 e to the i phi and uh, z will be similar e to the minus beta q plus i theta q x times sine of theta over 2 uh, and then there is some other angle so where phi and chi are angles in between 0 and 2 pi and theta goes from 0 to pi so you can check that this is a parameterization of C2 and uh, 
and uh, under this uh, uh, under this uh, yeah, identifications uh, what you have is that uh, x is identified with x plus 1 so x is a coordinate along a circle that will be the s1 and um, a while uh, phi uh, chi and theta uh, parameterize s3 <coughs> okay so indeed uh, this uh, this thing is well defined because so this gives a parameterization if you want of the so when you impose this uh, these conditions and the fact that these are angles this uh, parameterizes a fundamental domain under this identification and uh, you can check that this is uh, like uh, uh, indeed s3 times s1 because uh, it satisfies uh, e to the 2 beta p x uh, times the absolute value of w square plus e to the 2 beta q x times the absolute value of zeta square <coughs> equals 1. <coughs> okay, so now... We can also write down a metric on uh, our op surface, and uh, we can actually check that we can write metrics which are uh, of the form that uh, I wrote yesterday for these um, uh, manifolds on which you can preserve two supercharges, actually not just one, of opposite R charge. So indeed, we can write something as follows. And you can check that uh, this metric is invariant under the identifications uh, that uh, are written above. So this is a good metric on the uh, op surface. Um, are there any questions? So from this, you see, okay, so there is a killing vector dx. Uh, this just corresponds to translations along the S1. Uh, and you can also write down a holomorphic uh, killing vector, or actually I'm going to write down the corresponding one form, uh, which therefore will look anti-holomorphic, but... <coughs> so this is the holomorphic killing vector that we called K uh, oops, yesterday. And uh, you can uh, indeed check that uh, k square is equal to zero. And that it commutes with k bar. Okay, so then you can use this, uh, you can also check that uh, by using this k and uh, these formulas that I gave yesterday, you can reproduce, you can find out complex structures uh, which, well, we do correspond at least one to that uh, thing over there. Uh, okay, so we discovered that we can all on any primary off surface so on, N, on any primary off surface, let's call it uh, MPQ, uh, we can preserve two supercharges Q and Q bar uh, with opposite R charge. And uh, now, like, uh, if you think about this um, a little bit more, uh, you can convince yourself that uh, these parameters uh, P and Qs are actually the geometrical um, implementation of the two parameters P and Q, which appeared in the formula for the index. So you remember we had a formula for an index. This was a trace of minus 1 to the f times e to the minus. Uh, so the partition function z on mpq 
uh, will be the index uh, that we defined yesterday uh, with Fugasti's Q and P. Uh, and uh, moreover, like, well, if I have some other flavor symmetries, then I could add uh, background gauge fields along the S1, and those will give other Fugastis to the index. So that's up to quasi-linear energy, right? Yes, so there is, uh, there is a question about, okay, let's uh, be yeah, maybe a little bit less. Uh, yeah, so there, there can be subtleties with prefactors. So this is the, okay, so now I wanted to uh, say this uh, just because it's somehow uh, is, uh, I think, a good introduction to the uh, next uh, topic of discussion, which is like, uh, let we would like to understand how various supersymmetric observables depend on the geometries of these uh, uh, spaces um, that we can place them in. So for instance, like, okay, this is just one choice of metric which works. I could choose many, many other uh, metrics which are compatible with any given uh, complex structure on some hop surface. Uh, but uh, this argument tells me that in the end, like uh, the result is just going to depend on this P and Q, which are the moduli that characterize the uh, complex structure. And moreover, it's not just any dependence on Q and P, it's holomorphic in Q and P. So Q and P of complex parameters and they appear holomorphic in the answer. So, well, this tells us that uh, maybe uh, a good hint <coughs> It's the good hint that the correct answer is that, at least in this class of theories, their partition functions will depend uh, only on the complex structure and not on, say, the choice of metric. And moreover, that uh, the dependence on the complex structure should be holomorphic in the complex structure model. So given this example, this is just a wild guess. But uh, um, as we'll see, this is actually uh, what uh, is going to happen. But uh, in order to, to make a sensible statement, uh, we, need some we need some definition of this index where both Q and Q bar will appear, and P and P bar, and then you somehow demonstrate independence of P bar and Q bar. But the formula which you wrote last time only contained P and Q, so there was no question. Mm. Could you just write again the definition of I? Yeah, I only contained Q and P, I agree. But, it, but it's not a subtypical definition. You want Giving back your, your own argument. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. <coughs> okay, so um, if you want this, uh, this partition function, like uh, which in principle could depend also on p bar and q bar, yes. uh, like uh, turns out to be holomorphic. <laughs> And uh, and then I guess uh, that tells tells us that this index uh, uh, is uh, does not have dependence on. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Like I guess this uh, comment. Maybe maybe if I could phrase the question differently. So, uh, how do I know that this, the partition function on the manifold MPQ is actually an index of something? Yes, that's right. I'd like to see a circle which is separate and then some. Operate the space of the states defined by three manifold. Yeah, so you have a separated circle, so you could uh, define a theory on whichever squash spheres uh, <coughs> remains. Uh, like yeah, yeah. But does PQ act on this S3? What do you mean act? Well, they define the geometry of the S3. Well, they define the geometry of four manifolds. Right, but so once you reduce along the S1, you will have, uh, so you will consider some trace over Dilbert space of states on some squash sphere where the geometry of the squash sphere depends somehow on P and Q. Now, I'm not sure it depends on, on, on yeah, I think it will depend on the ratio between P and Q bar, if I remember correctly. And, uh, and then, like, uh, where the other parameters enter is in the way you identify the fields is going around the S1. So then is that it's, so it's a trace of, on the Hilbert space which itself depends on P and yes. and the operator which acts there also depends on P yes. and then some, by some miracle the P, Q, P bar Q bar depends yes. on yes. yes. which is not the, let's say like the, in the elliptic genus where we have the standard Hilbert space 
have an operator which depends on q and q bar, but the index does not depend on q bar. Yes. So that's more subtle. <coughs> Any other question on this before I go into? No. Okay, so I guess it's time to erase. I don't want to erase that, so. Okay, so I'm just taking this as a definition. So this is C2 minus the origin quotiented in this way. So the interesting fact that uh, I, I mean, I actually is that like these are all these are like this classification that is like a classification of all the uh, four dimensional complex manifolds with a diffeomorphic to S3 times S1. That is not a very obvious statement. I think it was due to Kodaira. Okay, um, so we we'll talk about this. Okay, so we would like to understand how these uh, partition functions, or in principle, some other supersymmetric observables, depends on um, the geometry of the space. Well, let's say M. So, so first of all, what what could it in principle depend on, like? Uh, well, for instance, it could depend on the choice of metric. Or because we are dealing with uh, complex manifolds, it could uh, depend on the choice of complex structure. Uh, moreover, uh, I'm not sure you remember this, but uh, at some point, well, it could depend, let's say, on other background, other Sugra backgrounds besides the metric. For instance, uh, we had a formula for V mu, this um, uh, conserved background one form, which appeared in Numima supergravity. And this was determined in terms of uh, the divergence uh, of the complex structure uh, plus some piece, which we called u mu. And uh, OK, we said <coughs> that u mu had to be uh, holomorphic and uh, conserved. Mm -hmm. So now the question is, like, can the partition function depend on what we decide to use as u? It's a freedom that we have to, that we can make. Uh, it's, uh, if you want some non-universal coupling to the geometry, and uh, you need to know like if the partition function depends on it or not. Um, and uh, moreover, we could also have a background gauge field, so we could also ask uh, like, well, how does it depend on uh, background gauge fields or other backgrounds that we'd like to introduce? Okay. <coughs> so in order to study these questions. Uh, but so I will not. So I will not present here um, the more rigorous proof, I guess, which uh, I can tell you about uh, if you are interested. But one thing you could do is somehow try to introduce appropriately twisted fields, well, at least for theories with some Lagrangian descriptions, which will be like uh, forms uh, with. Uh, which will be uh, holomorphic or anti-holomorphic, depending on the fields you're dealing with. And then write da rewrite the Lagrangians that come from uh, supergravity in terms of these twisted fields and check that uh, uh, somehow uh, all the terms, in if I do a variation of, say, the metric keeping the complex structure fixed, then this is always Q exact, and so on. Uh, instead, uh, what we'll do is something more pedestrian. Uh, which is 
we just consider this manifold to be, the manifold where we are, to be very, very large, so that it's very, in any given point, it's more or less like flat space. And then we will analyze uh, the, this perturbation from flat space using uh, linearized uh, supergravity. And uh, then you could say, OK, well, this is, uh, doesn't prove anything. And well, indeed, it's just an indication that uh, uh, the results that I'm going to present are correct. But uh, well, if one waves uh, one's arm very robustly, one can say that uh, the fact that uh, we have a scalar supercharge means that we can just analyze this problem near flat space, and that should be enough. Uh, OK, but this is maybe an argument uh, which is not very, uh, yeah, it's not very good. So you can also do this other twisting procedure, which, however, I don't have time, I think, to discuss. OK, so, so the idea is that we take this manifold to be very, very large, and then we study how the how the Lagrangian of our uh, theory uh, responds to this um, small change of uh, the geometry. And we know like uh, what it does. So there will be the change in the metric, which will couple to the energy momentum tensor. Then we'll have the change in the uh, connection for the R-symmetry, which will couple to the conserved R-current. Then we'll have uh, the change in this uh, uh, conserved vector field V mu, which will couple to uh, the connection which would give rise to the uh, string, to this F which enters <coughs> into the string current. And uh, well, then if we also have uh, auxiliary, uh, if you also have background gauge fields, then like we could imagine varying those, and this will couple to the flavor currents, and this will come with the variations of the uh, auxiliary components of the gauge fields, which couple to the appropriate scalar operators in the linear multiplet for the conserved current. So these are terms that arise from couplings to background gauge fields. And those are terms that arise from uh, coupling to supergravity at the linearized level. So again, these are not really independent because we want our geometry to be supersymmetric. So that implies <laughs> that uh, delta mu and delta v and delta g are all related to each other uh, in the way that uh, we discussed yesterday. So there are explicit formulas for v, a, in terms of the geometry. OK. <coughs> What about the domain wall current? Yeah, so that, no, the domain wall current is not there because we are considering theories which couple to, uh, which have an R multiplet and oh, which okay. couple to new minimal supergravity. Oh, so if you okay. were to redo this in uh, old minimal supergravity, uh, well, then in this you will also have uh, this uh, complex scalar M uh, which couples to something related to the domain wall current. Uh, okay, so uh, any question? Okay, so that's uh, the uh, logic that uh, we would like uh, to pursue. Okay, so before going to the more complicated part, which is understanding what happens when one changes the, the supergravity background, uh, let's uh, make some, le let's see what uh, one can say about uh, the uh, case of uh, the background gauge fields, which is somewhat. Uh, somewhat uh, easier. So, so we have to remember the formulas that I wrote up there. So those are the condition for a background to be supersymmetric. So that means that uh, the anti-holomorphic components of the field strength are 0, and d is uh, determined in that way. So let me actually let me rewrite it. So fi bar j bar is equal to 0. And d, if I write it in complex uh, coordinates, will be equal to minus 2i f w w bar uh, plus f z z bar. OK, so these are the condition for the background field to be supersymmetric. And uh, OK, 
locally, uh, okay, so th there is a there is a Poincaré uh, theorem, uh, lemma, whatever it's called for the bar operators. So locally, this thing means that uh, the corresponding gauge field, AI bar, uh, is uh, D bar of uh, some <coughs> scalar. And uh, if I am allowed to complexify the uh, flavor, uh, the flavor gauge symmetry, then uh, this would mean that uh, AI bar is uh, locally trivial. <coughs> so I could set it to zero locally by using complexified gauge transformations. <coughs> now, um, we want to vary a little bit uh, this uh, we want to consider a small variation of this uh, background. We, we, could, we could start with just a flat background, so there is no gauge field. Well, then the conditions uh, are that, um, okay, I don't need to rewrite them. They are just that uh, the field strength of uh, this uh, small variation is equal to zero. So di of delta j bar minus dj bar of delta i is equal to zero. But not all these variations will be, um, will be important because some of them are just trivial. Those are the ones which correspond to uh, actual um, gauge transformation. So the ones which are trivial are the ones where AI bar is of the form di bar of lambda. <coughs> so OK, this basically means that uh, the this deformation of these background gauge fields are uh, classified by looking at the cohomology of the bar. So, okay. So now we want to see, like, uh, we want to write down these terms and check uh, which one of these are Q exact and uh, which will and therefore will not change. Uh, the answer for some supersymmetric observable, and which ones are not. E okay. So I'm going to give some more details for the case of the gauge field, because it's amenable to be done in a short amount of time. And uh, then I will repeat more without many <coughs> details the supergravity case. OK, so you need to remember what are the objects which couple to the, uh, to, to, to the background gauge field. So again, these are objects which live in a multiplet, which contains a scalar j. And uh, there are fermionic operator, j alpha and j alpha dot. And uh, then there is the conserved flavor current. So and this thing is such that d mu f mu. Ah, the mu g mu f is equal to zero. Okay, so now we can uh, look at how the supercharge acts on these operators. Uh, that again just follows from standard uh, formula. So we have uh, our supercharge, which is determined by the spinor z, and uh, when it acts on the scalar component, it gives i z times j where j is this spinner. And uh, then uh, q zeta over j, that's 0. Well, that's expected because q squared is 0, so from this equation. And then you have uh, q acting on uh, j tilde alpha dot. That gives a minus i sigma tilde mu zeta alpha dot uh, times j mu minus i d mu j. And uh, q acting on j mu, that gives minus 2 zeta sigma mu nu d nu little j. OK, so these are the all the variations. Um, and we can now figure out, like by using the fact that uh, 
we have this complex structure that we can build out of Z, we can rewrite this, uh, this variation in a slightly more uh, convenient form by multiplying uh, this equation. So we take this thing and we multiply it by uh, something proportional to zeta dagger sigma rho divided by the absolute value of z squared, which again is well defined because z squared doesn't have zeros. And uh, okay, so here, just by counting, you see that there should be two uh, q-exact operators. And indeed, once you do this, what you find out by multiplying this thing by that is that, um, so basically, the q-exact um, the, the q-exact operators, so that the things that appear here, uh, just become just are the anti-holomorphic components of this object here. So let me write it. Uh, so then j i bar minus i d i bar j are q exact. Okay. So actually, you can even check that uh, these are not just q exact, they're also all the q closed uh, operators that you can write down. Okay. <coughs> so now with this information, we can just rewrite this, uh, this delta L over here. So delta L is A mu J mu plus DJ. And uh, okay, so we can do some algebra, which is not too complicated. And what we find is, sorry, let me put delta I mu and delta D. It's not really necessary. But so. And uh, similarly, so we have two complex coordinates, so we'll have some other coordinate, let's <coughs> call it z. So we have a similar expression. And then, okay, so this is a little bit. Uh, And in order to derive these uh, expressions, you will have, um, let me think, do you have to integrate by part something or no, I don't think you need to integrate. Yes, no, you don't have to integrate by parts. Uh, Jz plus i dzj. Okay, so now you look at this and you say, oh, but uh, this guy and this guy multiply the Q exact uh, operators. So this is Q exact on the nose. So this piece here is Q exact. This piece here is Q exact. And uh, the only uh, two pieces that remain uh, that uh, are not Q exact are the ones uh, here, which uh, corresponds to the variation of uh, the anti holomorphic components of A. And those are the components uh, which have to satisfy this, uh, this constraint. Uh, question? There is a plus sign missing, yes. Uh, and uh, any other question? You integrate by parts when you convert delta d into something into uh, the ratio. Delta d. So delta d is like a plus sign of. of uh, uh, so uh, delta little a. Okay, delta j is. Uh, you have a relation between D and F there. Yes, that. Oh, yes. Uh, right. Okay, yes, that's correct. Then I have to integrate my parts. So there will be plus total derivatives. Okay, so now we have to understand what happens to these two terms. So first of all, like... Uh, 
it, it would just seem strange that uh, this, this thing is uh, even supersymmetric, right? Because we just claim that all the Q exact, Q closed operators are just these. So how come that uh, this object, after I cancel these two pieces, which are Q exact, ends up being supersymmetric? So, but it has to be supersymmetric because it comes from a supersymmetric Lagrangian. So there is the, you know that that has to be the case. But uh, you can do a small exercise and you can check that uh, if I do the variation of these two terms uh, and I integrate by parts in various places, then what you get is the following. I mean, I guess this was expected, but let's... Uh, Okay, plus total derivatives. So Q of delta L or delta of delta L is this. And uh, then you can see uh, that uh, indeed uh, this thing is zero provided that the background is supersymmetric. So it satisfies this uh, relation. Okay, so the indeed you recover at the linearized level the same the same condition yet before. OK, so now we just have to uh, figure out uh, as something. Um, so OK, so we figure out that the, the background can only depend on delta a w bar and delta a z bar. So now you can, uh, again, make a clever argument saying, oh, but uh, my original Lagrangian, so the original Lagrangian was invariant under uh, background gauge transformations. By using the conservation of the current. Uh, and therefore, uh, that means that uh, if I take uh, a variation of uh, my, um, my A's, which is exact, then it better be that uh, this object vanishes. Okay, so this is a general argument. It has to be true, but uh, let's check that it is indeed true. And it was a very kind of unit estimation. Well, we are assuming that we are complexifying. Yes, there is a so we are allowing ourselves to complexify the flavor uh, gauge transformations. Uh, indeed, if you only allow for real ones, then you would not be able to say that uh, you can set such a thing to zero. So, um, okay. So, okay. So, how do we do this? So, we set delta w bar and delta is a bar uh, to epsilon. So, so we set uh, delta ai bar to be d of epsilon, ah, di bar of epsilon. And then we integrate by parts. So, and when we integrate by parts, we eat various terms. Some terms will have two derivatives acting on j, and some terms will have a derivative acting on the current. Okay, so we set this, then you integrate by parts. Then, in the terms that have derivatives acting on j, you use the conservation of the current. So then, and uh, after everything is done, what uh, you're left with is uh, q epsilon times uh, dw of uh, j w bar minus i d w bar j. Uh, plus a similar expression for dz. Plus total derivatives. OK, but now the operators that appear here are exactly the q exact ones. So you are indeed proved that uh, this, um, that these, uh, trivial uh, gauge 
changes of the background do not change the answer of the partition function. OK, that's uh, everything for the gauge fields. What we have proved uh, is that the answer, uh, the, the partition function, has to be uh, holomorphic in these uh, parameters that uh, classify the uh, backgrounds. Uh, because it depends only on delta A w bar and delta C bar and not on delta uh, and not on the holomorphic components. And uh, secondly, that uh, it only depends on cohomologically on the on these parameters. So, so this argument is still sort of a linear order. Yeah, yeah, this is so a how do you find <coughs> all orders or to the whole OK, so to be fair, for an abelian gauge field, I think this argument uh, just uh, is fine at all orders, because you can just, uh, I mean, because you can linearize around some non-trivial background, and the equations are going to be similar. Uh, for the case of supergravity, that's uh, clearly not the case. So that, as I was saying, uh, in order, so either you say that, well, the supercharge is a scalar, so working around flat space should be sufficient, or you can try to do better by really working at nonlinear at the nonlinear level. But for that, however, I think it's more convenient to introduce twisted fields and so on. But they said yeah. I see. So I'm just worried that there might be new dependence coming up if you go to second order third order. Yeah, so yeah. you want to exclude that. Yeah, well indeed. So when also in topological twisting you can just either define the theory in using uh, the twisted variable and then it's uh, well okay then it's topological in the usual sense. Or you can just, uh, sometimes you can see papers where they just look at the energy momentum tensor in flat space and they check that it's uh, Q exact. No? And they say, OK, that's, uh, that's enough. Uh, OK, so, but yeah, I'm not claiming that uh, this is a complete proof. I think you should uh, really work at nonlinear level. Uh, any other questions? I okay, just want to make sure. So actually, this argument sh shows that you don't need to pro uh, assume that the theory is invariant at the complexified case of summations of the flavor gauge fields. You just prove that the variation of Lagrangian under the formation of the gauge field, which corresponds to the com complex gauge summation, is too exact. Yes. So that's that's the. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so if you mm -hmm. because the the mm -hmm. measure is not invariant on the complex part of the summation. Mm -hmm. so, okay, mm -hmm. no, that would not be a good argument. This is a good argument. Let, let me think about it. Um, okay, yeah, I think that's correct. Indeed. So you, you don't want to set it to zero also. Yeah. You want to, so yeah, so if you say if it if it's there, then like uh, it's yeah, Q exact. So that this theory couples to polymorphic uh, line bundles for the clear yeah. symmetry. Yeah. That's a uh, ideal symmetry. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Right, OK, so um, so now we can progress to the gravity case. Uh, how much time do I have? It's still 12, half an hour, more or less. OK, good. I think that should be sufficient. OK, so for to, to understand what happens in the case of, uh, uh, of gravity, uh, you have to work a little bit harder. Uh, so before we go to gravity, so just, can you just repeat, uh, if, if my flavor symmetry was an abelian? Uh, well, if the flavor symmetry were non abelian, then uh, uh, OK, so. All the holomorphic uh, you know, back bundle, presumably. Yes, it would be it would be similar. I mean, either you can start from zero and then go a little bit away. No, it's, it could have no, no true topology. Even yeah, OK, that's, case, yes, yeah, sure. It's, uh, yeah. You cannot add that. But, so the current conservation will be some kind of current conservation? Wait a second, but I'm working locally. Uh, I mean, locally, the variation will be Q exact. 
I mean, it's true that it could be around. The variation is small, but it doesn't change the topology of the bundle. Yeah, sure. So, but since it's a topology of material, you cannot assume that you can set the background gauge field to zero and start there. No, yeah, right, okay. Yeah, that, that's. So then the current consideration is, should be the covariant consideration? Or what kind of uh, conservation of current? No, but I can, it's a, yeah, so I linearized around the uh, trivial background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Background gauge field, what kind of. So your argument here used the, that you can you yes, know, yes. pull derivatives. Uh, yeah. Ch yeah I, I, I did indeed. Uh, yeah, so this was fine for the abelian case. Um, Maybe it works equally well in the abelian case, but it's just. So two things could go wrong because the, you use the commutations. Yeah, and, uh, and and the conservation, right? And the conservation. Um, I'll have to think about it. Um, okay, so. Um, okay, so first, I, so so in order to understand how the answer might change, like uh, you have to understand like. Uh, how do you vary uh, a complex structure? So we can start from like, uh, uh, I mean, how do you look at variations of the of an almost complex structure and characterize them at the linear level? So the almost complex structure is defined in the following way. Uh, so okay, so therefore let's uh, let's just do a linear variation of this uh, of this equation then uh, what you get is that uh, well, delta j mu nu times j mu rho plus j mu nu times delta j mu rho better be zero and uh, therefore this means that uh, delta j with uh, holomorphic indices has to be zero why the delta j with uh, one holomorphic index and one anti-holomorphic index uh, is unconstrained. Okay, so this is just at the level of an almost complex structure, but uh, we have a complex structure, so that means that uh, this j has to satisfy this uh, differential equations, this at, uh, which involves products of j's and derivatives of j. So we have this uh, tensor eta mu nu rho, which has to be zero. And now we can do a variation of the complex structure appearing here and work out what it means. So setting delta j i j equal to zero, because we know that it has to be at least an almost complex structure, and see what constraint do we get on these uh, components, which were otherwise arbitrary. So and basically what you get if you do this computation, which is not too complicated, is that uh, you can define some <coughs> objects theta i, which are just uh, delta j i j bar times dz bar j bar. So they are one forms uh, with uh, values on uh, the holomorphic vectors. Um, and then what uh, this condition implies at the linearized level is that uh, uh, d bar of uh, theta i is zero. Okay. <coughs> Again, not all the theta i that uh, you get in this way, or if you want, not all the delta j's are actually interesting because some variations of the complex structure, which like, you could just make a an infinitesimal diffeomorphism and that will change the complex structures a little bit. And, uh, but that is not really a change of the complex structure. It's just an infinitesimal change of coordinates. So you want to know what are those that correspond to an infinitesimal diffeomorphism. So that's a good exercise. Actually, it's just a one line. But so how does so an infinitesimal diffeomorphism is parameterized by some vector field, epsilon mu. So what, uh, you're, you, what you want to know is uh, what is the form of uh, the lead derivative of uh, the complex structure along uh, this epsilon mu. So you want to compute the lead derivative along epsilon of uh, j mu nu. And uh, then that should give you the, the form of the delta j mu nu's, which are trivial. 
So you do this exercise, and what you discover is that uh, uh, the corresponding theta i's uh, must be d of d bar, sorry, of epsilon i. So again, uh, the problem, uh, at least at the linearized level, has uh, become a cohomological problem. You want to find the d bar uh, closed theta i's, which are not <coughs> d bar of something. Uh, so this is uh, some Dolbo cohomology for objects which are valued in the holomorphic vector fields. Okay, so it's a. So you want to find these, but uh, mod out by the theta i's, which are d bar of epsilon i. So again, this is only at the linearized level. So while it's true that uh, for any deformation of a complex structure, you can find a theta i with such, uh, with such properties, the vice versa might not be correct because there might be obstruction coming up at higher levels and I'm not going to be interested in such case. Uh, I'm just working at the linearized level. So if there are obstruction, then that would just mean that the possible variations are less than what I am considering. So are there any questions on this? No? OK, that's uh, good. Um, well, actually, it's interesting. So you can deform Lagrangian with it, right, by the first order deformation of mm -hmm. the complex structure, which might further happen to be uh, abstracted. But, but, the but in the theory, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't mean it. Yes. Yeah. That's, uh, that's the argument. It does. Maybe there are some contact. So if you try to exponentiate the deformation, maybe that's what happens. The contact terms. Uh, you are meaning like that the, the Lagrangian itself should see that uh, the deformation makes no sense. The abstraction yeah, the abstraction should appear there as well. Um, I don't know if it's a contact it's term it's because it's. Well, maybe in complex mesh two, the abstractions don't appear because it's uh, the abstraction is H two of the tangent bundle. Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, H2 minus 1. Maybe the dimension 3 may appear, but not dimension 2. Maybe, but uh, in any case, I said, yeah, the abstraction should be something that you could see locally. Um. So the abstraction is also homologically classified. Well, then it this argument with <laughs> So this thing which is called Bertrami differential actually right. solves a nonlinear equation. Right? Yeah. D bar theta equals theta squared yes. or something. So you first linearize it, solve the equation D bar theta equals to zero, find linearized theta, then you take the square and try to solve that so, equation. Yeah. So that's the reason. Right, there is, there is an obstruction there, yeah. But then I don't think it could appear in contact term. For, well, uh, we, again, more food for thought. But it's true that something bad should be seen at the level of the action as well. Um, OK, so so we just need one extra ingredient, uh, which is uh, that So I we also have to talk about uh, what uh, variations of the metric. Uh, but again, Variations of the metric means that if you vary the complex structure, then we also need to vary the metric in such a way that it stays Hermitian. So one, one of the conditions that we had for the geometry to be supersymmetric was that the metric had to be Hermitian. So that means that the, um, that the, that we have to figure out how we, so if we change the complex structure, we have to change the metric in such a way that it stays Hermitian, and we have to understand what, uh, what that means. So we have to linearize the compatibility condition for the metric. Okay, so we can work at first order in delta G and delta J. And uh, what we find is, uh, well, there is something which is more or less obvious, which is that the components of the metric, which, are, which have one holomorphic index and one anti-holomorphic index, those are unconstrained, but that is obvious because like, clearly I can make a change of the Hermitian metric and that will still be compatible with the complex structure. It's only the components which are zero which will have to change due to the 
change in complex structure. So this is unconstrained. If you want another way to say this is that they can always do a change of Fermi-Schon metric before doing the change in complex structure, and then that change is completely arbitrary. And the other components instead are determined by the change in the complex structure in the following way. So in th again, they involve these uh, uh, objects which parameterize the change in complex structure. Okay, so now you almost have all the ingredients that you need. The other ingredient that you need is that you have to use the formulas that I gave last la in the last lecture to compute, given a change of metric and complex structure, what are the changes in delta A and delta V uh, that, uh, that arise. So that I'm not going to show, but it's more or less immediate. I mean, not immediate, but it's, uh, it's clear what you have to do. Bunch of algebra. And then after you do that, you have to look at, uh, similar to what we did with the vector fields, you have to look at uh, the multiplet of currents and uh, find the equivalent of uh, these equations, except that now here you have to consider all the objects appearing in the R current multiplet, so it's much more involved. Uh, and then you can play the same trick. You will multiply some of these by some spinners to get expressions like this that say the sum of the components of the operators which appear in the R multiplet are actually Q exact operators. So you will do this, then you can rewrite delta L in terms of, the, of this data. And what you find is that uh, delta L is uh, a bunch of Q exact terms <coughs> plus various terms multiplying delta J I I bar uh, times some operators O of I bar I. And uh, then uh, that's it. E and now you can uh, say, OK, so this already tells me that uh, my Lagrangian will only depend on delta j i i bar and not on delta j i bar i. So it's holomorphic in these uh, parameters. Uh, this delta j's have to satisfy this, uh, this delta closeness, uh, delta bar clo clo closeness uh, requirement. And then, exactly as before, you can make the short argument, which is, oh well, like uh, if I consider a variation of the complex structure that is trivial, that just arises from uh, an infinitesimal diffeomorphism. But uh, my original Lagrangian is, uh, I mean, is, very is diffeomorphic invariant. And therefore, that uh, uh, this, uh, this change better be uh, Q exact. And indeed, that's what happens. Or you can, like, um, substitute for delta j something which is exact, then integrate by parts using the conservation uh, equations for the, uh, for the R current multiplet, and rewrite this, uh, the resulting operators that arise here uh, as uh, Q exact ones. So that's, uh, so the, the yeah, so this, uh, this analysis is completely parallel to the case of the background gauge field, but it's just more involved. And uh, so the results, are that uh, z, so another thing that you notice is that there is no variation of the metric here. The delta j, delta g i j bar did not appear anywhere. They appear here. So they, uh, the, the partition function on m uh, does not depend on the uh, Hermitian metric. So on the choice of Hermitian metric compatible with the complex structure. And uh, it depends or can depend on the complex structure model but uh, only 
uh, holomorphically. Well, holomorphically, maybe it's a little bit too much. It's, let's say, locally. There could be singularities appearing somewhere. Indeed, if you check, for instance, the expression for the index that I gave yesterday, and you vary p and q, you can find all sorts of singularities. It means it's a meromorphic function of p and q's. Is it actually, like, in other options, that it's not actually a function? Could there be an anomaly? So it's yeah, there could, yeah, so I, this I, I should also say that uh, all what uh, I said so far like, uh, is uh, disregarding the possibilities that there are any anomalies. Uh, so that's, uh, that's actually an interesting uh, research project for whoever is interested. Just like 20 years ago, this, this yes. <laughs> there was some of so, Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, but uh, this is certainly um, a point that is worth stressing. Um, okay, so this is uh, the um, so this is like the um, main point that um, that I wanted to make about uh, the dependence of the partition function on this um, on this geometrical object. Uh, actually, there is. Well, you, you could have wondered what happened to the dependence on the background fields. So the, as I said, there is this, uh, this U that uh, appears in the, in the variation of, uh, in the formula for V. So what uh, you can uh, check uh, is that uh, that U uh, actually satisfies some, so there are some U's which are exact. Uh, in a sense which I have not explained, <coughs> but I can explain if you are interested. And then you can show that uh, the Lagrangian does not depend on those, uh, on variations of U which are exact. So again, the dependence on this U is uh, only uh, cohomological. Uh, so, okay, so this, uh, this concludes this topic. So unless you have some question. So, okay, so in the remaining nine minutes, I think, is it nine minutes? Okay, I can talk, uh, maybe say something about uh, um, what happens in three dimensions uh, instead of uh, four. So I will have to just uh, keep my comment short. So n equal one uh, in uh, with uh, with u one r in four D is uh, simply related to n equal two in three D. Again, with a u one r symmetry. And indeed, you can uh, obtain a lot of information about these theories by just uh, dimensionally reducing uh, facts that you know about the 4D case. Uh, so for instance, these uh, theories also have an R something which is called an R multiplet. <coughs> and this R multiplet comprises a conserved R symmetry current. Then, as usual, when you dimension reduce, you will get also a central charge, and uh, there is a corresponding central charge current, which is also conserved. Uh, then there is the energy momentum tensor. And then uh, there is also something which uh, uh, is related uh, to, the, um, to the string current. And uh, so there is a scalar, uh, and uh, well, and you can form a string current coming from it. And uh, that's and then there are the gravitini alpha plus mu alpha dot. So again, the structure of this multiple you can get from dimensional reduction from the previous one. And uh, st st also the supergravity 
it looks very similar. There is uh, MUR, some uh, connection for the UNR symmetry. Then there will be some connection for the central charge uh, and uh, all the metric. And there is a scalar H which couples to J. And well, then there are uh, the gravitinos. So sorry, these were the su did I say these were the gravitinos? I might have misspoken before. So these are the gravitini which couple to the supercurrent. And uh, so instead of yeah, so instead of working with C, it uh, actually is useful to write things in terms of. Uh, the dual of the field strength, uh, which, is, uh, which is conserved. So this looks like the field V in, uh, in new minimum. And so you can repeat the story that uh, uh, we did in 4D, but, uh, but in 3D. And uh, you can find similar results. Uh, so in particular, it turns out that the geometrical structure, which is parallel to a complex structure in 4D, is something which uh, goes the name of a transverse holomorphic foliation. So you can find details in uh, our paper. Uh, but again, uh, this uh, a lot of the things that you know about complex structure go through for this transverse <laughs> holomorphic foliation. There is some notion which is equivalent to Dolbock homology and uh, then you can try to characterize what are the moduli spaces of these transverse holomorphic foliations and you find out that uh, they are characterized very similarly in terms of this other thing which is similar to Dolbock homology and uh, that these moduli spaces are usually finite dimensional etc etc <coughs> and then you can uh, repeat the you can repeat this analysis that uh, I described today and you can find out that uh, the uh, partition functions then will only depend on the do not depend on the choice of metric which is compatible with the structure but only on the choice of this uh, transverse holomorphic foliation and uh, and mathematicians have classified uh, uh, which manifolds admit such structures and uh, for instance the manifolds with diffeomorphic to the three sphere admit uh, one parameter family uh, of uh, transverse holomorphic foliations where the parameter is complex uh, and uh, indeed uh, that is uh, to be related to the squashing parameters that people introduced uh, uh, on the tree sphere except that yeah so that's uh, that's one thing that you can say um, uh, and actually uh, just on the tree sphere as for the op in some sense, the three-sphere is just what you get dimensionally reducing the op surface. And so exactly in parallel to the op surface, where there was primary op surface, so this gives this uh, uh, modular space of, uh, uh, of transverse homomorphic foliation, which depends on one para complex parameter, which I think you can say it's p over q bar or something like so. And uh, then there are also isolated uh, different isolated transverse holomorphic uh, structure corresponding to the dimensional reduction of the non-primary off surfaces. Um, and uh, so, okay, so that, uh, that, that, uh, that classification goes through exactly, exactly in, the, in the same way. Um, okay, so f for instance, uh, one can uh, give some, w one application of uh, these ideas uh, in 3D which I think is, I can probably sketch in the remaining two minutes. <laughs> yeah, five extra minutes, which is late. Oh, okay, well, I can uh, should allow some time for some questions, I guess. So this uh, transverse homomorphic structure, is it different from the contact structure? It yes, it's different than a contact structure. Uh, it is related to an almost contact structure. Um, and uh, then there is an integral, so as for the, so as for the case of the complex structure, there is an almost uh, contact structure, and that's uh, whatever something similar to the com almost complex structure. 
But then the integrability requirement uh, that uh, for the complex structure gets translated in some integrability requirement for this, uh, for this object, which makes it into a transverse holomorphic foliation, which basically means that uh, yeah, the space is transver transverse to the, to the vector which defines the almost contact structure have a complex structure, and as you move along, uh, somehow these uh, complex structures are like, uh, like behave nicely. Uh, I mean, I could write down the equation if you want, but we can also discuss it later. I see. So there is some con counterpart of this a free answer. Yeah, yeah, there is. Uh, yes, uh, there, uh, it's actually much easier. <laughs> let's say that. Uh, um, yeah, it's it's not. Uh, and there is a counterpart, so again, in also in for this uh, transverse homomorphic foliation, you can introduce complex, co you can introduce a coordinate along the vector for the complex structure, and then in the transverse spaces, you can introduce a complex coordinate, and then the transition function going from patch to patch are going to be holomorphic in these uh, coordinates on the transverse. So it looks very much, ba basically, well, at least for what I understand, everything you know about uh, complex structure is an equivalent for <laughs> transverse holomorphic foliations. Um, okay. Um, so. So as an application of this. Uh, this background supergravity ideas. I can talk a little bit of uh, how to use them. So people computed uh, the partition function for this n equal to field theories on uh, various squashed spheres, which depend on this parameter b, which uh, is this parameter for that I interpret as uh, the saying which is the transverse homomorphic foliation that you are using. <coughs> But um, the squashing parameter for the real sphere should be real. No. Um, so, yeah, the squashing. So, if you interpret this as a squashing, then. Uh, so, there are. It, 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 the definition is not very. It's not super easy. <laughs> so, but let, let me try. To, let's, so, there are different squashings, which uh, in principle are not even related to each other. Uh, and. Uh, the, the different squashings, uh, like, uh, so for instance, in some cases, this for some of the squashing, this parameter is real. For some other of the squashing, this parameter is imaginary. Okay, so they correspond, and this, like, look at the some, the at first sight, unrelated squashings of the sphere. Okay, and uh, you can even define, like, you can even keep the metric round and change the other supergravity backgrounds and get a squashed sphere in which the parameter appears not in the metric but elsewhere. And then like, then it's not really a squashing. I don't know what you want to call it, but there is some dependence on this parameter. So it's, so the geometric, so if I give you the metric for a sphere, like actually saying which is this parameter is not, uh, you need extra information. So is it some super geometry which, which has a parameter of? of uh, it's equivalent to the parameters P and Q which appeared in the <laughs> op surface. So if you reduce that well, discussion, the there are two, but when you reduce, you lose one. You lose one. Yeah. One, it's, ob I mean, the radius of the S1, you clearly lose. And then you, I think, yeah, in some sense, some combination of the angles. Is it limit when both P and Q go to one, so that log P divided by log of Q remains finite? That I'm not sure. Uh. But what is important is that there is some parameter. Uh, and for specific. For specific uh, cases in which this uh, this uh, this partition function has been computed, you can uh, now like uh, use this fact to use the fact that you know how to embed this uh, um, to describe this geometry in terms of this m coupling to supergravity to say something something useful. <coughs> yeah, I, I do think that the log of ratio of log p and log q is the squashing parameter. So you think that b is the ratio of log p yeah, with log q? I think, for example, you can take elliptic gamma, take a limit. And Okay, so then I so then I stand. Is it log p over log q or log p over log, log q, q bar? Log q, log p over log q is a b squared. Should be homomorphic, right? Okay, that's mm, not what I remember, but maybe there is a question <coughs> of definitions. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> 
okay, so, um, but I think you can find the answer in th this paper about uh, dimensional reductions of dualities by Cyberg, Willett, and uh, Razamat. Uh, so th over there, I think they have uh, some precise uh, match between this B and the P and Q. Uh, okay, so we can, so, l so let's take the round sphere, which we'll say corresponds to B equal one in some set of conventions. And with some slicing of this, uh, of this uh, space of uh, squash spheres. And then you can uh, like, uh, look at what happens uh, into the Lagrangians when I vary B away from, uh, from the round case. So then uh, delta L, so if I do delta B, then you'll have some delta L. And this delta L will involve uh, this background fields in the supergravity multiplet, which couple to the conserved dark current, and C mu, which couples to uh, the conserved central charge current. And actually, it turns out that, that uh, at the first order in delta B, uh, this is all what there is. So the other auxiliary field doesn't enter. And then there are higher orders in delta B, which, so there will be delta B squared, which multiplies some operator. Okay, so again, uh, we are considering a variation uh, near, the, near the round sphere. And actually for round sphere, uh, we have to be more precise because I said, as I said, you could have like a non-trivial B even on the round sphere. So what we mean is that when the sphere is round, we actually take a theory uh, and uh, conformally couple it to it. Okay, so that's the <laughs> definition. <coughs> and then you can give an interpretation uh, for what the variation of the uh, of z with respect to b at quadratic order around the round case should be. And uh, well, there should be in principle two contributions. Uh, one which involves integrating over the sphere a two-point function of the conserved currents. So for instance, there will be some vectors which like in order to find the pre precise expression, you have to study the background, which integrate j mu r at x and j nu r at y. And th then there could be other objects involving uh, j mu z. But uh, OK, so now let me. Let me say another thing. So let's suppose that we consider uh, some theory on, uh, on the sphere. Uh, and then uh, we make the sphere larger and larger. Then the theory would flow to, some, would flow to, the, to the infrared. And in the infrared, the correlation function of j mu z, j mu z becomes a redundant operator. And, uh, the, um, and therefore, like its correlation functions are only uh, non-zero at coincident points. Uh, so here, we'll write that there could be contact terms. So we are using implicitly that the, co the, the partition function does not depend on the size of the manifold. Um, so there are contact terms that I will discuss very briefly uh, later. And then at order delta b squared, you would also have the uh, expectation value of this operator O, but uh, in a conformist field theory, that's zero. So you don't get it. Uh, so you just have this. And now we have to discuss these contact terms. Um, so this would like uh, take a while to uh, explain. But uh, the, uh, so these this, this contact terms can, in principle, give some non-zero contribution because you are integrating them over the entire manifold. Uh, but you can, uh, you can prove that they only change uh, the imaginary part of this uh, object and not the real part. So if you concentrate on the real part, then it's all encoded into the separated, uh, at of in the two-point function at separated point uh, of the conserved dark current. And uh, this, uh, you can uh, just uh, write down for a general uh, superconformal field theory. Uh, 
and it depends on one parameter only. Well, there are some factors. And there is delta mu nu d squared minus d mu d nu of 1 over x squared. Uh, and, the, and this parameter tau r uh, also uh, determines completely the two-point function of the energy momentum tensor. That, that's related by superconformal symmetry. So then you can just compute this integral by using the conformal map from flat space to the sphere. And uh, then you integrate over the sphere using this v that comes from uh, like uh, the background. And uh, you compare with what people obtained for the partition function. And in this way, you can determine this uh, number which characterizes your CFT. OK, zero minutes, and then done. So.